Uh, not yet, not yet. Uh, okay. And I think it appears that we are officially live. So hello, everybody, and welcome to another session of our Sussex Vision Seminar Series, as always, within the Worldwide Neuro Initiative. I'm George Cafegis, a master's graduate from Thomas Euler's lab and currently a PhD student with Tom Baden. And as your host for today, I would like to once again be begin by thanking Tim uh, Vogels and Panos Bozelos for putting forward this ever-expanding initiative towards a greener and much more accessible seminar world. Having said that, allow me, of course, to get back to the reason we all gathered here for today and introduce our guest from the Institut de la Vision, Dr. Olivier Mar. Olivier did his undergraduate studies in engineering at the Ecole Polytechnique, followed by a master in neuroscience from University of Paris. For his uh, PhD, together with Yves uh, Freignac at, at the Unit of Neuroscience, Information and Complexity, Olivier studied both from a theoretical and an intracellular perspective the activity in recurrent cortical networks, with the focus being on the primary visual cortex. And it was during uh, postdoctoral years at Princeton with Michael Berry that uh, Olivier work, worked on large scale multi electrode array recordings of the retina in uh, search of population codes. In 2012, he joined the Institut de la Vision as a research fellow and within a year started his own group in the Department of Retinal Information Processing. Uh, his research interests vary but are centered on the retina, from what the retina does and how it does it, both at the level of isolated circuits and population codes to clinical applications of uh, vision restoration through optogenetics or gene therapy, and then to evolutionary aspects of retinal processing with interesting preliminary work on mouse uh, Lemur vision. In his talk today, however, we will be hearing about something I haven't mentioned this far, uh, namely how the retina process uh, natural scenes and to what extent the context matters. Uh, the title of the talk is evidently Context Dependent Selectivity to Natural Scenes in the Retina. And without any further ado uh, from my side, please all welcome Dr. Mar. Uh, Olivier, the stage is officially all uh, yours. So uh, thanks a lot, George, for the very kind uh, introduction. Also, although I don't, I don't feel like I'm studying so many different things, but uh, okay, I guess that's fine. So, it's coming uh, straight from your website, Olivier. <laughs> yeah, true. But actually, my website uh, is a description of a group, which is actually a multi-PI uh, group. We, we're, we're three. And so I guess that's, that's also why it might... Uh, anyway. I see. <laughs> um, so... Uh, I mean, we all have imposter syndrome at that stage anyway. So, okay. So, well, first I wanted to really thank a lot, uh, uh, George and, and Tom for, for the invitation, uh, but also in general for organizing this series. Because, I, I mean, this this series has been uh, really informative and great, and also probably one of the you know, few best uh, positive outcomes of COVID, I guess. So. Uh, I really wanted to 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 thank them for for organizing that. This has been really a lot of re, uh, great resource that I've uh, used a lot in in my lab for uh, for group meetings in particular. So uh, as uh, George said, I, I'm going to talk about um, basically uh, how the retina. Of, I mean, our recent progress on how the retina progress uh, process natural scene. And uh, but before that, I just wanted to make a, a general point. Uh, which is kind of goes beyond the retina. Uh, um, so, which is the way we kind of study uh, that kind of question. So, let's say you have, you know, uh, um, a complex natural scene. Uh, in the the normal coding question is basically trying to understand how these this complex uh, visual scene is transformed uh, uh, into a set of spike trains from different neurons. So here you see a raster where this is time passing. Every line is one cell, and every point is a spike. And essentially, in the normal coding question is trying to understand the relation. Uh, between uh, the, the stimulus and this response, wherever you're recording this neuron from. Um, and um, <clears throat> broadly speaking, uh, there have been many approaches to try to address this issue, to try to understand how, um, how this can be done, how you can transform this visual scene into a set of spike trains. And uh, I mean, on one end of the spectrum, I, I'd say there's something like a classical approach where you uh, you use relatively artificial stimuli like uh, this checkerboard pattern, random checkerboard patterns, or this grating with various orientation, and uh, this has been extremely useful uh, to to get insight about how neurons process visual information. Uh, so I've mentioned, of course, a few historical papers uh, and reviews, uh, and more recent ones. Uh, there's obviously tons of it. I couldn't just mention a, a small piece. The, the, the idea is that out of that, you can get a very interesting property, like you know that uh, neurons that, are, uh, that process visual information have receptive fields or can have orientation tuning if you talk about the visual cortex. Similar example could be found in the retina. 
And this is definitely very useful. Uh, however, I guess the drawback here on that side of the spectrum is that uh, you still have to address the issue of whether this is relevant to how these neurons will process natural scene, natural scene directly, because hey, what's more ecologically relevant than a natural scene? And this addition dates back in various forms from, from a long time ago, at least from Jerry Ledvin, who is here, quietly smoking in his in his rig. Uh, in the, you can see the party cage behind, I think. And, um, and, and of course, on one end, this is great, because uh, this is ultimately what you want to know about. How, how does that work in real life? Uh, on the other end, the issue there is that, you know, uh, um, uh, Visual scene is composed of many parameters. And while artificial stimuli, you can vary systematically the parameters and find when the neurons are responding here, there's many things evolving at the same time. So it's obviously harder to tease apart what is doing, uh, who is doing what. Uh, I mean, the, the, the most recent uh, flavor in that direction is actually to try to learn complex model and try to fit them to the data. So like, for example, deep network models, which, like, which are basically just uh, successive layers of filtering and nonlinear processing. Um, and so trying to predict as well as possible the neurons you're recording from. Uh, so this is, this is uh, obviously uh, difficult. First, you have to find the right model. Second, you have to evaluate if the model is right or wrong at predicting. And this is actually more challenging than it sounds. I'll come back on that. Uh, and, and finally, even if you actually get a model that works, uh, there is still an issue that you need to interpret it. And of course, if it has many parameters, that's not an easy task. So for that reason, um, many, several people um, have tried to look for a middle ground. And there is, among many others, uh, I just mentioned in a very biased way, the one from the retina that I've had, uh, that I've done uh, talks in the in this series. Uh, so there's like, you know, so I, I, I'm citing the talks basically. So there's Friedrichi, Tim Golish, Jesh Linsky, Marcus Moister. Uh, there's obviously others. Uh, I just cited one of the most recent review, but there's many papers and many attempts to try to, on one end, keep the ecological relevance of uh, natural stimuli, but at the same time, somewhat manage to keep something, to do something more systematic and um, better parameterize, like artificial stimuli, to try to have a more exhaustive uh, look at what's going on there. Um, so that's basically what we have been trying to do here too. Uh, so we are trying to make small progress on this question that was already explored by others with different means. Um, and so here are going to be a, a bit more specific. So I'm going to talk about the retina. I guess most of you know where the retina is. And um, this is, you know, the retina view from the side. You, you, most of you know that most of it start with light transduced by photoreceptors. Then the signal goes down through several layers, ending up with ganglion cells that are sending their spike to the brain. Ganglion cells uh, come in different types. And uh, the textbook view, which uh, is that um, a ganglion cell, each type kind of encode a different feature of the visual scene, extract this feature at different places of the visual, uh, the visual scene. And broadly speaking, the kind of question I'm asking here is, what actually is this feature? Um, so how to address this question? First, you need to record these neurons. So I'm not going to say a lot of my methods, but let me just show you my, my method slide here. Here we're performing, um, as uh, George was slightly alluded to during his, um, uh, his introduction, large scale recording in the retina. So basically, we just take the, the, the flatten the retina against an array of electrodes and record from many, uh, many electrodes. This is now, I would say, uh, pretty much a standard method. So I'm not going to expand on it. Uh, out of this, you can get the activity of a couple of hundred cells and you can edit for several hours. So here in this uh, work, I will um, talk about. Uh, mostly mouse and axolotl retina. Um, sorry, no sharks for George. So <clears throat> uh, now let's say you actually can record one cell and you want to know what this cell care about when it's looking at visual scene. What is the feature that it's extracting? Uh, well, to address this question, a classical method is to do spike trigger average. So let me just, most of you probably know about that, but let me just describe again what we're we talking about here in a simplified way. Um, so you can just present various random frames, random checkerboard frames here, uh, while recording the activity of the cell. And the cell will just respond to, let's say, selecting a bit the temporal axis here, uh, uh, will respond to each of them with a number of spikes. And so if you want to compute the spike trigger average, the standard method would be that you take each frame, multiply it by the number of spikes it, emit, it, it evoked in the, in the cell, and then just take the weighted sum of that. 
And by doing so, you would obtain uh, a spike, what is usually called a spike trigger average, which is a good linear proxy for what people usually call the receptive field. And so um, thanks to that, you start to have a good idea of what this ganglion cell care about. For formally speaking, what this is telling you is what should you do to increase the fine rate of that cell? And here it's pretty clear what you should do in that simple case is that, well, there is a region that these ganglion cells care about. So this is where you should do something. And what you should do is to actually increase light inside this area and because it's an armed cell. And so if you were to do that for various ganglion cell types, you would obtain a various type of receptive field. Uh, some would actually, somewhere it would prefer light increase and somewhere it would prefer light decrease. And if you were to expand a bit more on the, on the, on the cell types than two, beyond two, you would also find different selectivity for, for uh, the size of the object. So basically these, these receptive field would have different size. Uh, and of course there's also surround and all that. Um, so basically uh, that is already giving you an interesting insight of what ganglion cell care about. But of course, as I said in the introduction, you have to check if this is all there is uh, when, this, um, when this retina is watching a natural movie. And of course, a lot of people have, have addressed this uh, question. I'll just take one example from the Shishin Liski lab. There are others, including from my own lab. Uh, but here, the idea is that they just basically take this spike trigger average and use it as a filter. And any stimulus that comes, they can just filter it with this spike trigger average. And then, well, I'm not going to spend time on, on, on what happens after. It's just basically something to transform the, you know, the, scalar, the scalar number that comes out of this filtering into a set of spike train. The details, I don't think they matter here. Um, the point is that if you do that and if you do it correctly, um, then you can test if that model predicts how the, the scanning cell is responding to, um, to, to uh, let's say, a, a sequence of spatial topological noise like in that case. So uh, like you just display a, a, a checkerboard um, uh, evolving over time randomly. So here, basically, you repeat the same sequence of checkerboard stimulus over and over again. Each line is just a repeat of the same sequence, and it's just one cell responding here. And you see in black the experiment and in red what the model is predicting. And in that case, um, the, the model is, is doing surprisingly well. However, if you now try to do that for a natural scene, the same model actually fails miserably. I mean, it's, it's not completely horrible, but I mean, let's say it's really missing a lot of stuff here. So obviously, there's more to, for, from this result, uh, there's more to the processing performed by a ganglion cell on natural scene than just the, 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 recepti the, the linear receptive field. And it's not about trying to fix these, uh, these latest part here, the, the nonlinearity part. I mean, you can really, I mean, at least maybe, at least in, in some cell types, you can really show that there's something more than just the, the, the spectral average. So, so now you're left with the question, well, Ganglion cells care about more than just the receptive field when they're watching a natural scene. And so what do they care about? How can I find about the feature they, they, they care about? And as I said, many people have tried to address this question. So we, we, we tried our own way. I mean, it's an important question because we, we have seen this on and off selectivity here happening. And we can wonder if that is even true for more natural stimuli. So our, our own way to, try to address this question is to start again from these uh, local this this uh, sorry from this receptive field and uh you know kind of take the hypothesis they're making seriously and push it until it breaks basically so the idea is that as i said this 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 uh, spike trigger average classical spike trigger average tells you that uh, your ganglion cell is selective to light increase inside uh, this small area so if this is to be true all the time including for during natural scene stimulation then this is what should happen. So let's say you're just recording that ganglion cell and you flash a natural image and you obtain a response. If this is all there is, if this is really the only thing your ganglion cell care about, what happens, the luminance inside this area, then the best way to increase the response to that natural image should be to increase the light in this area. So literally to add this receptive field to the image. So you would obtain something like this, which is a bit ugly, but you get my point here. Um, and basically, you this would should be the best way to increase the response uh, of the cell to that image. 
So now this is actually an hypothesis we can test. And basically this was the motivation for the, the, the following experiment. So what we did here was that we, so we were recording Ghanaian cells, as I explained before. And first we were presenting a set of reference images like this one. So we just flash the image for 300 milliseconds and then we, uh, they are interleaved with like gray screen, uh, with a gray screen. And uh, basically we record the response to this image. And then we perturb this image by adding a checkerboard pattern. But um, one important point here is that we calibrate the amplitude of this checkerboard pattern to be just, I mean, the smallest possible that will slight, evoke a slight change in the response. So basically, the, the smallest amplitude that will evoke a detectable change in the, in the response of ganglion cells. So we really try to make it as small as possible uh, to be in some sort of a, to be some sort of a kind of a small perturbation. And so we obtained this. We obtained basically the same image with a perturbation. Here, the checkerboard is a bit enhanced to, to make it visible. And the idea here is that now we show this and we record how the ganglion cell will change its responses. And then we repeat the same thing. So we have like basically always here the same reference image, but every time a different pattern. So one thing I should say here for to, to really make, put you on the right track is that, so there are many perturbations for the same image, but what I'm not showing here is that this is interleaved with the presentation of other images. So there is no specific adaptation to this image. It's not really pattern adaptation we're looking at here. It's really just probing, poking the nonlinearity in the system. Um, and I'll, I'll come back on that. Okay, so the, if you find this a bit twisted, let me just give you two other ways to, to see it. The first one is the more abstract way. Basically, if you think about this, the stimulus space, which is obviously a very high dimensional space, uh, this natural image is one point. And what we're doing is that we're staying in a neighborhood, but just poking this, uh, this point, uh, poking this stimulus in, in various directions and see how this impact the, um, uh, the response of the ganglion cell we're recording. And if you're more on the biological side and all this seems very abstract to you, well, I like to think about it that way too. Um, basically what we're doing is that looking at the system at work, which is basically the retina processing natural stimuli, which is what it's supposed to do. And then we introduce some perturbation. So classically, when you think about biological perturbation, you think more of something like knocking out some genes or maybe doing some optogenetic uh, stimulation or silencing some group of neurons. Here, the perturbation we're doing is a bit more, is a bit different. We're just perturbing the stimulus itself. So you might think that this is absolutely different, uh, or you can think about it as something conceptually similar or related. Hopefully that helps. Okay, so now um, we're just, you know, flashing these different uh, perturbation on top of the image. And then we look at basically each, uh, each of them will, will evoke different responses in the same ganglion cell. And so now we can basically just try to correlate the change observed in the response and the pattern of perturbation. So the way we do it is very similar to the spike trigger average that we did before. We just take each perturbation and multiply it by the number of spikes evoked uh, by this perturbation in the, the response of one ganglion cell. And then we just take the sum and we obtain something like this. So that's what we have called local spike trigger average. So spike trigger average, of course, in reference to what I was talking about earlier, and local because, as I said, we are just always staying close to the image and somewhat we're, in theory at least, we're, we must be dependent on this image. So, so that's what we call it the local STA. And that we, that's, a, that's how, or you can also call it image dependent receptive field, but this is how I will call it in the following. Okay, so now what does that look like? Okay, so here is two examples. Uh, so this is one classical off cells in the axolotl. This is basically the receptive field measure with classical tools. And this is uh, an on ganglion cell uh, in the mouse retina also with the receptive field measure with classical tools. And now we actually, for both cells, we have measured these local STA starting from different images. And so for, so here, the, the one column corresponds to just really one cell, and this is just the other cell here. And so at first you, you see that, you know, if you start from this image, for example, or that one, or that one, or even the gray screen, um, the local STA doesn't seem so different from the classically defined uh, spatial receptive field. It's look kind of the same story. So, so far, nothing really surprising. But for other natural images that we start from, so it's the same cell, but now if we basically measure these local STA uh, starting from, from this image, now we actually see something very different. Now actually it seems that it, you, we get an on 
uh, um, local STA. And so that means that basically uh, the best thing to do if you want to increase the fine rate, if you start from this image, it was to decrease luminance in this area. On the other hand, now for the same cell, if you start from this natural image, the best thing to do if you want to increase the response of the cell is actually not to increase luminance in this area. And so conversely, for, for the, the, the mouse ganglion cell here, the on, on ganglion cell, um, so if you start from this image, the best thing to do if you want to increase the response to this natural image is actually to increase uh, light in this particular area. But now if you actually start from this one or that one, actually what you should do is decrease light in this small area. So it seems that depending on the image, what you have to do to increase the fine rate is uh, can change from light increase to light decrease or vice versa. And uh, well, usually when I show these results to at least to retina aficionados, uh, the first question is, okay, so for what kind of cell type do you see that? And the answer is actually for many cell types. Ooh, I need that part. So here is uh, basically uh, each line here on the on the right correspond to a um, uh, different type of cell where we have actually seen consistently um, this, this effect, uh, this basically on off selectivity changing with uh, the natural image we start from. And uh, so one thing is, which is interesting to notice first is it's like, it's not just one cell type. We see that for uh, various cell types. Uh, the way we've classified the, the cell types, sorry, I should have mentioned that, is uh, following an approach um, that was um, done by, by Tom, but also Catherine Franco and Thomas Euler, uh, where we display a special uniform stimulus. Uh, so this is basically luminance of the special uniform stimulus over time here. And here you see the average response of, of, of the cell. So each line is a different cell. What I think is most interesting is the pink area where you have the, you know, the, the on flash here and the off flash here. And you see that even some cell like this one, for example, are a really strong on response and almost no off response. And I said almost no off response, uh, can actually uh, see this switch between on and off local ST as measured before. So it's really depending on the, the natural context. Uh, I mean, one question I often ask is as on this is uh, whether this is just only on-off cells that are showing this behavior. And I think the answer is clearly no. You do have on-off on cells like this one, for example, here or here, but it's not the entire thing. On the other end, not all cell types show this, thing, uh, this behavior. And I think one thing to say here is that if you actually have a type where you could call, that you could call a pure on or pure off with absolutely no response, uh, then usually you don't see that. So in effect, what's really happening here is that if you just go and again, take that example, there is a strong on response. There is a really small but visible uh, uh, off response that you might neglect. Um, well, it seems that with the proper natural context, with the proper natural image, you can actually just change that balance and make that, make that off response uh, much bigger, uh, much more important than, much more dominant than the, the on response. So in effect, we're not saying that, you know, all the cells can be on and off depending on the context, but they can ch definitely, ch definitely change the balance between on and off as a function of the stimulus. And if I say it like this, it might remind you a previous work from uh, TKG Amberian et al, but also from Pearson and Kirchensteiner, where they have shown that when you, ch switch, when you change the background light by a large amount, uh, you can actually change the, the respective uh, on and off responses. Um, so here we're not changing the background light level, this is maintained constant, but we also see the same effect by simply changing basically the natural context if you want. So, okay, so really the, the relative importance of the you know, on and off responses can, can depend on basically uh, what stimulus you start from. Okay, so polarity, and I mean by this basically on off selectivity is context dependent. So of course it, it's it's a strange result, and and you'd like to to understand it better. And if you want to understand it better, you have to defer to modeling. So can we find a model to reproduce this finding? This was basically the next next step of our work. And uh, to to address this question, uh, during the same experiment, we were also presenting unperturbed natural images that were different from the image we 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 perturbed. So this is really this joint set of images, and we used this data set uh, to train two type of model. The first one is a classical LN model. So this is basically just a linear filter plus a nonlinearity. This is something that has been used a lot in the retina as usually as a null model. 
Um, and then we also uh, used uh, so something fancier, which is basically a convolutional neural network model, so a CNN model, which is basically composed of several uh, features in the first layer. So it's a two-layer network with several features in the first layer, several filters followed by nonlinearity, and then another layer of linear pooling. So if you don't know so much about deep network, it doesn't matter. The point here is that it's a two-layer network, and, and so far, this is the only thing you need to know. Um, so when you learn this model, and then basically first what we did is to uh, assess them by asking them to predict the response to repeated, unperturbed flash natural images and see how well they do at, at predicting the response to that. Um, and, and of course, I mean, the CNN, which is kind of more complex, uh, does better than the, the LN model on that. But the, the thing that we really care about is whether they can reproduce the local spike trigger average. And so here you see the same two cells I was showing before. And now we're going to ask if these two models can actually reproduce, re reproduce this finding. Uh, we can basically ask them if they can predict the local STA. And the, the, the LN model is really, really performing badly on this. Uh, essentially, it's like never changing. Uh, I'll come back on that in a minute. And, uh, and it's really not capturing this change in polarity that we see, nor the displacement that we often see also. On the other hand, the CNN model does pretty well. Uh, it, it, it's not, not being perfect, but it actually captures most of these, uh, it, the, the polarity and the position of these local STA across different uh, images and all that. So, <clears throat> so okay, we're happy. We, we have another that seems to work. Uh, before moving on, uh, I'd like to somewhat give a bit of intuition of why it's why the LN model fails and why do you actually need to resort to this kind of nonlinear CNN model to make it work by stepping back a bit and be a bit more abstract. So let's let's consider for a minute the you know the function that going to transform the stimulus into a response. So that's that, that just simply the, the function that takes the stimulus as an input and and um, um, output the response of the neuron of, of one neuron. Um, so, so of course, it has more than one dimension, but it's just here for the, the simplicity. I'm just plotting here as if there was only one dimension in the stimulus. Uh, here, but what have we done when we try to compute these local STA? Essentially, we are just focusing on a few points, which are your uh, the reference natural images, like these two guys here. And we are exploring a small neighborhood around that given point. So we just poke the stimulus in various uh, um, um, uh, in, in the neighborhood in various uh, uh, delta here. And uh, we just ask, okay, what is the response in that case? And then the idea of computing the local STA, so computing the, the, the linear approximation of what happens here, means that basically we're trying to approximate what happens here with a linear function, so with, with a slope. And if you remember your, your uh, math classes, maybe that dates back from some time ago, but that should ring a bell because Basically, uh, what we are doing here is like approximating locally the, the, rest, the a complex function by a linear function. And that's basically in, here taking the derivative. So calculating the slope and taking the derivative of that function. In a multidimensional space, uh, that derivative is also is, is called a gradient. So basically, essentially what we are doing here is that we estimate empirically the gradient uh, of our stimulus response function around a few points here. And uh, that's basically what you can uh, think of as the local STA. So basically, your local, the local STA that we're computing here is an empirical estimation of the gradient of the stimulus response function. And uh, if you have studied a bit that, you, uh, there's one property of the gradient which is well known, which is that if you have a linear function, the gradient of a linear function is a constant. And that actually explains why we see here that the LN model, which is not linear, but almost linear, let's say, actually has a you know a constant local STA because its gradient is constant. So that's why it just cannot work in that case. Uh, and basically that's why also like estimating this local STA is really estimating the signature of nonlinear processing because uh, the, the the thing that nonlinear process do, non processing does is really changing the gradient. Okay, so after that parenthesis, uh, we can so far call ourselves happy because we actually have find, uh, found a model that uh, does well at predicting these local STA. But now we need to try to understand why this model works and what's, what's critical here. And so for that purpose, we've tried to simplify the model as much as possible while um, trying to retain the qualitative feature of predicting at least qualitatively these local STA and this inversion in polarity. And we ended up with a model composed of basically still two layers. 
But the two layers have basically at least two filters. They must have at least two filters. One which is basically off-like, so a filter which uh, somewhat uh, select for um, you know light decrease, and one which is kind of on-like, so uh, selecting for light increase. After these two uh, kernels, so they are both convolutional, uh, which means that they are both convolved with every point in the in the image. But that doesn't matter for the moment. Um, then the output of this kernel of this filtering is then passed through a nonlinearity, which is basically thresholding, uh, so putting to zero everything that is negative and keeping as such everything that's positive. And then there's a second layer of linear pooling plus nonlinearity. But then actually looking at this, we can start to uh, have a better idea of what's going on. Because let's say you have a stimulus, which is activating more strongly the, the off-kernel, but not so much the on-kernel. So the on-kernel output is negative. Well, then the on-kernel here will be set to zero while the off-kernel is actually just uh, intact. And of course, when you're going to perturb this, uh, you're going to see the impact of this perturbation out of the off-kernel and through the nonlinearity here. But the on-kernel on the other end, since it's, it's zero, it will still be zero. And so basically the perturbation will have no influence of that, on that zero output after the nonlinearity. And for that reason, basically, then the, you know, the Jorgenian cell, which is predicted by the two-layer network, will basically reflect the response of the, this off-kernel. And for that reason, if you start from there, basically, you're going to have an off-local STA. Conversely, if you, if you change from uh, the image, if you change the input, so that now you have another image, and that image activates a lot the on-kernel, but not so much the off-kernel. So the off-kernel is kind of thresholded out, while the on-kernel output is, is, is intact. Well, then you get the opposite behavior. Then basically, once you perturb something uh, uh, from the, this image, um, what I mean, the, the output of the off-kernel is always zero. It's not changing, while actually there is some change you can observe in the on-kernel. And so in that case, of course, you're going to have actually a on local, uh, local STA because you're dominated by the on kernel. OK, so looking at this, uh, this model, which kind of somewhat at least qualitatively explain what we see, it's obviously very reminiscent of uh, the retinal circuit as we know it. So in the retina, as, as most of you know, you have like an off pathway of bipolar cells and you have the on pathway, the on, or bipolar, uh, the on bipolar cells. And, uh, you know, they can be converging to the same uh, on uh, to the same Ganglion cells either directly through direct connections or actually indirectly through through polysynaptic connections. So uh, a single Ganglion cell can definitely be influenced by by um, by both. By the way, and so out of that, um, we thought, okay, so basically, if there is a mapping between these can these kind of kernel and the off bipolar cells and these kind of kernel and the on bipolar cells, uh, well, one way to kill the on local STA would be to block the on the on bipolar cells. And that we perfectly know how to do. It's a very easy experiment. Uh, so you can basically just put LAP4, which is a chemical that will basically uh, block the transmission from photoreceptors to on bipolar cells. And if you do that, basically it's equivalent to kind of removing this on kernel. And since this is necessary, to, it's necessary to have this on kernel to have uh, on local STA, the prediction is that by doing so, you would still have intact of LSTA, but actually completely gone on local STA. And basically this is what we see. So here, this is just one cell, which has shown both on, it's an on cell, but it has shown both off local STA and on local STA in the normal conditions. And then we basically just merge again these, these, the same local STA after putting LAP4. And in that case, the off ones are pretty much intact while the on, are, the on one are completely gone. And this is something we see over, over many, many cells. So, I mean, it doesn't, it's probably relatively obvious, but actually, yes, indeed, this, uh, this um, um, changing of uh, the polarity of these local STA really depend on the convergence, we think, of the on and the off uh, bipolar cells. Uh, I'm not saying that all the cells that, uh, that show these actually are bi-stratified and receive direct connections from on and off bipolar cells, but at least indirectly, they are somewhat influenced by both on and off a bipolar cell, we think. Okay, so we can find a nonlinear non model that predicts this, um, the, this finding, and it relies on basically a nonlinear combination of on and off uh, input. Now, this is great, uh, but I mean, there's one last question remaining here, which is that uh, we want to know better, basically, what's the relation between um, uh, these, uh, the image and the local STA we get. And the reason for that is that, you know, a lot of study just, you know, show that, you know, whatever processing is done by whatever neurons is depending on context, uh, in sensory context. 
uh, and sometimes end up here. The, the problem with that is that, you know, then if basically every time you change the image, your ganglion cell care about something different, then how can you extract anything reliable from that ganglion cell? So if you want to extract robust information, like if you want to be able, be able to decode something reliably, um, or at least transform some, transmit some reliable information with these cells, um, they, you know, th there must be some, some order in that chaos. So this is what we actually wanted to, to look for next. So we go back, we went back to the, the initial ID that I just showed already. So imagine that you have, you, you have basically your ganglion cell responding to these four natural images. Uh, in the first place, we said, well, okay, I mean, if it was always the same local STA, the best way to increase the fine rate for starting from each of these um, uh, natural image should be to just add to them this, um, this, uh, this blob and obtain this one, and this should increase the fine rate. Uh, so that would be true, but we actually, uh, so sorry, one way to, to see it a bit more abstractly is to say, okay, so in the stimulus page, if the, each of these stimuli is one point. Uh, and so in, the, in this abstract space, these change correspond to basically moving always in the same directions. So always adding the same thing. So always moving in the same direction in the stimulus space. Okay, so that would be nice if this was true. But of course, the problem is that we've shown that uh, these on-off select uh, these on -off, these local state depends a lot on uh, which uh, natural image we start from. So in practice, the picture might be a bit more like this. You know, every time you start from a, a natural image, to increase the fine rate, you should go in a different directions. Uh, so the question is whether there is some sort of an order in this chaos, and um, <clears throat> to 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 try to assess it. Basically, our goal from there was to try to basically do that plot that you see on the left, but for real and try to find the subspace because of course we the, the, the space of possible stimuli is too high. So try to find a subspace where we could actually visualize it and still uh, get all the information. And for that purpose, we took advantage of the fact that we have a, a model, the CNN model that seems to predict pretty well how, you know, uh, what is the local ST in response to Im uh, various images. Uh, and since this is, so we took a leap of faith and saying, okay, so maybe this model is good for any image. And so we took 3,000 different images and for each of them, for just one cell here, we're just generating the corresponding local ST according to the prediction of the model. And what we noticed here is that, okay, of course they are changing polarity depending on the image. So here, every time you have one image and the corresponding local STA, so one image, local STA, one image, local STA, you always have these pairs. And now we can ask, okay, how much do they change? Well, they do change in terms of polarity and sometimes shape, but they won't change that much. So when we ask, okay, can we describe them in the lower dimensional space? And to do that, we did the, the, the simplest thing, which is to basically do a, a PCA on this, on this local STA. So each here, each image here can be taken as a vector, and then you can do PCA on all these vectors and just find out um, uh, what the PCA tells you. And the PCA tells you that basically, uh, the first two components can explain a large fraction of the variance, like 80 to 90% depending on the cell, which means that basically you can decompose each of these local ST as a sum of a weighted sum of these two components. So basically it's going to be uh, the sum of this times a number plus the sum of the, this plus a number. So basically with two numbers, you can just describe almost entirely what a local ST is about. So now this is great because basically we can project everything on these two components, basically taking a scalar product between each of these local ST and each of these image and describe everything that's happening. So in practice, it looks like this. If you didn't follow exactly how we do that, that's fine. You can just remember that we have somewhat a relevant subspace where most of the changes in the local ST are described. Uh, so here, basically, if you have a pair of one image and the corresponding local ST, we're gonna just plot it like this in this uh, subspace described by the two principal components I was talking about earlier. So the, the image is described as a point and the arrow here correspond to the, the local STA. So again, this makes a lot of sense because what we're always saying here is that the local STA is basically where you should go if you want to increase the fine rate of the cell. So basically if you start from this point in this subspace and you want to increase the fine rate of your cell, that's where you should go. If you want to increase the response, you should go this way, left world. And of course, now you can plot it for other uh, lo uh, localized pair of local STA and image. So here is another image with another local STA. 
So you start here and you go in this direction, and then you have the orange one and you start here and you go in this direction. And as I said, with the model, we could actually, with the model which is learned on each cell, we could um, basically do that for many different images. We could predict the local STN. We can plot all of them for a single cell. And this is what it looks like. So this is what you get for a single cell. And immediately you notice that it's not pure chaos. There is definitely some order there. So basically, every time you start from a given point here, no matter where you are, what you, should, what you need to do if you want to increase the fine rate is basically get away from the central point. So basically, always you have to go centrifugal. You have to go away from this point. So what is that point that everybody is scared about? Uh, well, that point is exactly actually a gray screen. So basically, all these arrows are telling you um, get away from the gray. What does that mean exactly? So it means that, for example, here, if you have a lot of dark inside your receptive field here, uh, what you should go do is get even darker. Uh, so basically, dark gets darker. On the other hand, if you have something bright inside the receptive field and you're here, basically, if you want to increase the frame rate of your cell, you should get even brighter. So it's it's actually very simple here. Brights get brighter, dark get darker if you want to increase the frame rate of your cell. So from there, it's very easy to, to, to realize that, in fact, this cell uh, some are coding some sort of a contrast here. And what I mean by contrast, because there are many definitions here of, of, of contrast that people have used, here we're really referring to basically luminance minus gray squared. So we're really removing the sign here. Uh, so basically it doesn't matter whether you're getting away from the gray uh, by being brighter or being darker. In both cases, you just had, a, you, you had here, you have the square here that removes the sign. So in, in effect, we have actually tried to model this with a very simple model where we compute these quantities contrast average over inside the receptive field more or less. So basically we just compute this local contrast. And now we just ask, okay, so how's that like local contrast able to explain this? So we basically just took this. Uh, it's not a great, it's not, it, it, it's not a, a model which is as good as the CNN, but let's see what it predicts uh, in terms of that kind of vector field that I'm plotting here. Uh, and the answer is actually qualitatively, you get more or less the same thing. You get this, 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 uh, you know, this centrifugal pattern here. So basically, there's a lot we can explain about the response of these cells and this context-dependent selectivity, on and off selectivity, by just realizing that these cells are here coding for contrast, for local contrast. Um, so, okay, knowing this, now we know. Okay, so basically, if I want to increase the uh, the, the fine rate of the cell. If it's bright, I should make it brighter. And if it's dark, I should make it darker. Uh, so can we just, but we have found that based on, you know, this, this CNN model. So can we try to just go back to the experiment, go back to the data and without any kind of modeling assumption here, somewhat find clues that goes in the same direction. So first to do that, we went back to the data we already collected and we try to find it to just cherry pick case. This is really cherry picks example here. Uh, cases where you know there was uh, you know some interesting stuff happening inside the receptive field, let's say. So let's say very bright stuff and very dark stuff. And indeed, in these examples, we find that, for example, there's a striking correspondence between the, the bright region in the image corresponding to on region in the local STA, and the you know like here and here, and for the dark region like here or here, they correspond to the off part of the local STA. And you can see all these you know fancy Gabor things and all that. Um, but there is definitely always a correspondence that you can see pretty striking between like, you know, dark regions and off part and uh, bright region and on part. So, so okay, so it seems that there is a, some, some uh, without doing any modeling, looking at this data, it seems that there is indeed a correspondence here, uh, but we wanted to have something more predictive and, and not cherry picked. And so for that, we reason the following way. Uh, so if we start from an image and we have a corresponding local STA, in that space, as we said before, uh, it should be one point for the image. And basically the way to go is for the local STA is to get away from, from, from that central point. So we thought actually, if we take the negative image and by negative here, I mean just really inverting black and white. Then in that case, according to our qualitative interpretation, then basically the local STA should go in the different directions, which means the, in the opposite direction, which means that if it was on, it should be off. And if it was off, it should become on. So that's an hypothesis. We can just test directly on experiments. 
uh, without any modeling assumption. So we went back to experiment and just did that. So here, this is just one example of a cell where we have measured the, these local STA for uh, various images. So some natural images and then some inverted or negative images where basically it's the same thing, but black and white are inverted here. And indeed, in that case, we found that, you know, all these kind of off-like local STA that we had here became on-like once we actually took the inverted images. So this is giving support to this idea of a contrast encoder here that we were formulating, but without having to, to rely on, on all the assumption that comes with models. So this is really in the data, you can see it. Okay. So, all right. Uh, basically, what we found here is that so this on-off selectivity can be reshaped depending on the natural context, but we can find a model that kind of predicts this finding. And basically, this context dependence does not keep these cells for actually robustly encoding something. It's just that you know what they are robustly encoding is not luminance. I mean, if we are to rely on these cells to find out the luminance, probably you will have some 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 troubles here. You will have a hard time to decode luminance. But, uh, but here actually contrast is very well encoded and, and, and you can actually decode it uh, from these cells. So actually this is a point I think uh, worth making for when people mention context dependent processing of sensory neurons to, rem to remember that you know, uh, context dependent processing can mean sometimes just you know, basically uh, extracting a slightly more abstract feature than we when we thought in the first place. Uh, now I'd like to just conclude on on making a few discussion points here. Uh, the first one is so well, of course. So here, as I said, on off selectivity depends on the context. That's like you know, take a message. But uh, I mean, just I'd like to make a few discussion points about you know the approach we have used here. Uh, so first, I'd like to mention that you know this, this idea of computing this you know local so this gradient, this local receptive field, can be seen as a way to test models. What I mean by this is that usually uh, when we want to test a model, so we usually we have learned the model, the model parameters on some data set and we want to test it on by trying to predict the response to other uh, stimuli. Of course, the number of stimuli on which you're gonna test it will always be finite and probably small compared to the number of possible stimuli. So let's say, you know, you have these two stimuli here and basically you have measured the responses and now you want to check if your model uh, does well at predicting them. So let's say that this is your model, the, the black curve. So here you should call yourself very happy. But on the other end, the, 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 the issue here is that, well, there could be other models that perform equally well uh, at predicting these average responses. And so how do you solve that problem? Or how, how can you tease apart if your black model is better than these two gray guys? Uh, with just that kind of data, you can't. On the other end, um, if you actually have access to, you know, what these local STA, which somewhat our good proxy for gradient and which correspond to here in 1D uh, derivative, well, then suddenly your black model is consistent with the estimation of this derivative while these two gray ones aren't that much. So you can see this competing of local ST as a tighter constraint on, on models as a way to somewhat uh, uh, discard some alternative that actually went, wasn't that good. And of course here, it might look very abstract. So let me give you an example, which, um, okay, it doesn't happen all the time, but let's say we, my, my students have only actually just found an example, which I think is, is kind of uh, interesting from the pedagogical perspective. So let's say here we had like, you know, uh, one cell and we had these local STA here, uh, these are the data. And we had two models. Basically these two models, you need to know much about it. I mean, uh, to, I mean it's basically just uh, uh, two models learned with different set of hyperparameters. And if you look just at, you know, the average, uh, how they were good at predicting the response to, uh, you know, average, the average response to flash natural images, the R square are pretty similar, right? So it's like 0.88 here, 0.84 here. I mean, uh, of course, you're going to prefer the one with 0.88 and you should be right. But honestly, I mean, 0.84 is something that, you know, might just uh, be satisfying. But actually, if we ask these two models to predict this local STA that we have access to, we realize that you know, like the, the first model actually is not so bad. I mean, it's not perfect, but it's 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 pretty good. On the other end, the mo the second model is really a disaster here. I mean, it works well here, but like otherwise here, it's actually the wrong polarity, and I don't even want to talk about these guys. So, so basically, this small difference in R square here ends up in a pretty big qualitative difference in terms of predicting local STA, and that's why I really mean by saying that you know, like measuring these things somewhat gives you, really put a tighter constraint on what on what models have to achieve 
to really be good models. And and I think that's important also to, you know, then, you know, think about these modeling process as not just like, you know, designing a mod the model and then just having the R square calling yourself happy, but then actually just thinking about, okay, what should be the next thing to do, the next perturbation, the next, you know, uh, thing to do with stimuli and recording experiment to uh, somewhat find bigger, bigger constraint and tease apart different solutions. Now, the second thing is that, you know, look, going back to, to this plot here, um, I've been often asked to, to, I've been often asked, I've been asked a couple of times, how can we relate this to, uh, you know, the idea of maximal images? Uh, so recently there have been several works where people basically with very nice and various techniques, they were basically trying to look for the image that would maximize the response. So basically, so usually that's called like the maximal exciting image. There have been various work on that. There's, there's more to come, I guess. And um, the the idea here is to just basically uh, change your your the image that you're flashing on your on your um, uh, visual system. So I, I think the, the first work in V1. There was also work in IT, and there was probably some ongoing work in the Retina, as far as I know. Um, so the idea is to always try to um, you know find uh, the the stimulus that will evoke the largest response. Uh, the so it's a great tool. And it, I think it's very insightful, especially for when actually, in, in some cases, for some cell types. But one thing to, I guess, to keep in mind here is that in our case, in the case of that cell, you can see that if you believe in that, that arrow plot that I'm showing here, there are a lot of points, so a lot of stimuli, a lot of images, where basically along these ellipses, more or less you should always get the same response. So there's like some basically some direction, some change for which basically the response is left invariant. And this feature is actually as, as important at least as the maximally exciting image. Uh, the second point kind of cautious note about these maximal images is that, um, you know, basically the answer might, because of that property, because of the fact that, you know, uh, you can actually have the same response for various stimuli in that case, um, they, you can also depend a lot on your explorer ensemble. So like oversimplifying and caricaturing things a bit, imagine that basically you're trying to find the maximal, maximally exciting stimulus uh, in that pink ensemble. They're going to find that, you know, this is probably the right point here. But this says as much, I mean, it's informative and it's really good and it's interesting for modeling, but uh, it you have to be care careful also about the fact that the, the answer depends also on the explored ensemble here. So again, I'm not saying that these are uh, this is a bad idea. I think this is a great idea, and, and these maximally uh, exciting images are, are a really useful tool. But uh, the the in the, in terms of interpretation, the the of course the limitation is that is to believe that basically this maximal image tells you summarize everything about the what your Galilean cell is doing here. Anyway, so these are kind of complementary tools to what we've been doing, of course. Now, okay, so to finish, I'll say that, you know, uh, there's obviously a limitation here in what we have done, uh, which is about uh, time. Uh, we have um, we have kind of collapsed everything in terms of the temporal axis. So uh, we have uh, just looked at flash natural images and basically how many spikes in response to these images. We're trying now to expand this kind of perturbative approach with more dynamical stimuli. I think the reason why we only found basically luminance encoding cells where all the arrows were going in the same directions and kind of contrast encoding cells like this one is probably because we have neglected time here. And I'm, I'm guessing that probably we're going to find more diverse patterns if we manage to extend that to, to include the temporal axis. Finally, uh, if you have uh, listened to me up to here uh, um, uh, and you're not a retina person, uh, uh, bear with me. I mean, well, bear with me. Uh, uh, be rewarded by saying, I think there's not that much that I said, which is really retina specific here. And, uh, you know, the, it might be possible to use similar approaches. I don't know, but it might be possible to use similar approaches to characterize also the processing in other areas like V1, for example. Okay, so with that now, I'd like to just uh, conclude by, by thanking the, the people who really did the work here. So this was a joint uh, work spearheaded by, by Matthias Golding, a postdoc in my lab, and Baptiste Lefebvre and Samuel Virgili, two PhD students. Uh, and it was also in collaboration with Mathieu van, uh, van van Kang and Ulysse Ferrari, who's also a PI in, 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 in the team too. And in collaboration with uh, Thierry Moura in Ecole Normale Supérieure and Alex Aker uh, in uh, Göttingen University. Uh, so, 
if um, you find uh, this interesting and if the prospect of doing some science in, in Paris actually interests you, we're actually recruiting. We are kind of a multi PI. I mean, we have several PI in the group and uh, working together to make theory and experiment to figure out things about the retina. Uh, uh, and of course, well, so drop me an email if you think this is kind of interesting for you or if you just want to discuss. And of course, I should also acknowledge the, the various funding so sources. And of course, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Olivier, for this uh, very interesting uh, talk. There are already a couple of questions appearing in the chat, but uh, let me remind uh, the audience at this point that uh, after this first uh, round of uh, discussion that I will moderate by conveying the questions you post to Olivier for him to address, uh, we will be continuing offline. So in case you are interested to follow the conversation until the end, I'm already making available the Zoom room that we are currently seated at, uh, so you can join us there. Uh, so the first question is from uh, Suva Roy. How does the STA of classical on cells and off cells depend on the distribution of contrast in these natural images? Because natural images with the same average contrast can still have different structures, and this seems to influence the location and polarity of the STA. Yeah. So I mean, the thing is, yeah. So here, all this, all the images we were flashing, global contrast and luminance were equated. But of course, you, you, I mean, we are recording from many cells, and and they're looking at different parts of the images, so we could not equate. Um, the the local contrast. I mean, so they they do depend uh, in the sense that in exactly. I mean, well, I can. I'm not. I don't know if that's a, a correct answer for what Suva is asking. Uh, but basically, they they do depend exactly in the in the sense you see here. So basically, um, I mean, the further away you get from that central point, the more contrast you have, and so basically that's the way you're going to increase the fine rate of, of of these cells here most of the time. So I don't know if that addresses the question of of Suva or not, or otherwise. We can give it a second, like until like maybe yeah. a follow up uh, or elaboration appears. But in the meantime, given that you have this plot here, one question I have is like because we see that it's symmetric in the amplitude of the centrifugal motion, right? Mm -hmm. So this could also be a matter of how the center interacts with the surround, right? So because you are also interleaving your stimulus, like with randomly, per like with random images that are perturbed with noise. So the temporal sequence that the cell sees is completely different in terms of the spatial structure that Suva mentions in the natural scenes for the uh, temporal window also, right? Because it changes very abruptly. Yeah. So, yeah. So yeah, that's a great, I mean, so in, in principle, um, I mean, the, the role of the surround here, I think is not absolutely crucial, although it does play a role. I mean, the, the reason why I believe that is that if you look at basically the, the, the model we ended up with, like the, the simple interpretation we ended up with here, um, there is no, like, so basically that, that plot here, um, there's no absolute need for the surround, although it certainly plays a role because you actually see that there's some surround in this first layer. Uh, so the exact role of the surround in generating these uh, local STA, short answer for me is that if you want to see this change in on-off selectivity, Strictly speaking, I don't think you need the surround, but I'm also pretty much convinced that the the surround must play a role in kind of changing the answer, basically. Right, because in principle, like if with STA, we could get perfectly the surround, the same yeah. thing that you would expect with the center that you increase the luminance there and you see a, 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 like the strongest increase in firing, you could also expect by changing the surround, right? Leaving the center as it is and changing the inhibition you could receive from this surround. Yeah, absolutely. So yes, I mean, um, yeah, here, for example, you could imagine that you change the surround and this is kind of changing where you are on this kernel here. Right. And then that would change the answer. Absolutely right. I mean, yeah, one, one thing we, we've thought about so far is actually to also try the same kind of experiment, but like kind of masking the surround uh, mm -hmm. for some cells. Uh, there's some technically here because when you, what does that mean to mask the surround when you have 200 cells? But uh, yeah, basically that's that's the idea. Right. And before I continue with the questions uh, that Tom has posted, like uh, one follow up of mine is like, so have you tried this experiment at different light intensities, like changing the ratio of center and surround? And yeah, that's 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 a great question. We have not. Uh, I think it would be very interesting. Um, I think it would be very interesting because, um, well, first of all, you, you you do change the center surround interaction when you change the luminance. But also, you can, I mean, all this thresholding I'm talking about here. Is also changed, right? I mean, uh, you, you, there, there's a lot of things that are different if you really go at low luminance level, and uh, it would be very interesting to know uh, what's going on. So we haven't carried out that these experiments, uh, but yeah, definitely it would be 
well, very interesting to know also because we know that different background luminance by themselves can actually change the polarity. And it will be kind of interesting to see the interplay of both. Right. Thank you very much, Olivier. So there is a clarification from Suva. Uh, just for my clarification, what do the PC1 and PC2 capture in terms of the image property, like variance yeah, yeah, of yeah. contrast? Yeah, yeah. And the so I went through that, but pretty quickly. So uh, I'm guessing. So, I mean, here the PC are relatively dumb if you look at it. I mean, they're, they're basically, if you look at the, I mean, you can look at the predicted local STA and actually get, get have a pretty good guess of what this PC will look like. I mean, there's a first one, which is really a blob in the center. Uh, with maybe a bit of surround, but basically here, and and then the second one. I mean, if you look at the 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 the, the you know what it looks like, the appearance, it's kind of a way to displace it to displace your local STA a bit. Uh, but it's it's basically almost a, some sort of a derivative of the first one in some way. So basically, um, what they are capturing here, uh, essentially here, you can think that this axis is somewhat the, the let's say, the, the local luminance inside uh, the receptive field here. Uh, zero being like gray, and then, you know, like going from br bright to dark, okay? Mm -hmm. Bright on the right and dark on the, uh, on the left. The second principal component is a bit harder to explain, but I think it has to do with uh, basically uh, uh, this local ST displacement, which is also, also an interesting feature that we see in this data. So hopefully that helps. So now I can ask like one of Tom's questions because I think it fits perfectly. So he says that by I at least quite often the positions of the same cells on and off component are only partially overlapping. Are these cells therefore driven asymmetrically in space by on and off? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. So basically, <clears throat> um, some of these cells might be asymmetric, but I have to say we haven't looked at it systematically because th there's an issue here, which is that the first thing that going to drive whether uh, let me go back to here. Uh, the first thing that will actually tell you uh, where you're going to see these on-like or off-like local STA is also the image, right? So depending on where you fall compared to the image, uh, you're going to, like, for example, here. So here you see the local STA mostly on the right, the on-like one. Um, but it's mostly because, I think, because the bright thing is actually on, on, the, on the right. And when we flash natural images, we don't know where the receptive fields are yet. So of course we kind of you know um, um, and and we cannot systematically explore that, so we don't know. That said, you you're absolutely right that uh, this could be a way. If basically we would have to depart, I think we would have to depart from natural images and use something uh, a bit more regular, and then we could we could actually probe uh, different regions of on and off like uh, LSTNs and find out. That actually would be an interesting uh, an interesting idea. Uh, the fact that they don't overlap is actually absolutely clear, and, and it's definitely something that CNN reproduces also. Uh, but yes, so they are definitely not, if you look at examples that I showed before, um, like real examples, not from the model series here, well, here's probably maybe not the best one, but um, you, you see that they are definitely changing location here and there. But uh, I, I don't think we have seen any systematic bias for like, you know, on being in one place and off being in another place. Uh, but to be honest, it, maybe it's there for some cell types and we haven't looked at it. Right. And the follow up on that, that uh, Tom posted here in the Zoom room, uh, if you were to do a covariance analysis, uh, do you think you could find similar special receptive fields for both on and off? Uh, so you mean like kind of local spike covariance kind of thing? Uh, that would be, well, that's kind of challenging to do experimentally, but um, I'm guessing, I, I well, my guess is that if the SDA are already so different, I don't see any reason why the spectral covariance would actually be similar. Um, I mean, well, if you go back to this abstract picture, uh, I mean, the local STA is basically telling you, okay, what's the best straight line to fit this function locally? Uh, if you add spike to covariance, you're asking, of course, in a high dimensional space, but you're asking, okay, what's the best curved function? So here it's, it's pretty flat, but basically if you were to be here, you would see, you know, probably, you know, uh, you know, something like this, while if you were here, you would see something like this. So basically my guess is the, the covariance, the spike to covariance would give you different results if you were able to do it. That said, experimentally, it's kind of hard to, to, do, to do it properly. Mm -hmm. And uh, before I ask the last question that, uh... Tom posted uh, in the YouTube uh, channel. Uh, I would like to remind our audience that in case they want to 
continue either to follow or participate in the discussion, they should uh, click on the Zoom room link that I have posted earlier. Uh, and the last question is, of course, like cross species comparisons. Uh, salamanders have a lot more on off cells than mice. How is this reflected in the proportions that show this switching? Uh, yeah, so unfortunately, we haven't looked specifically at the. We, I, I don't think we have a good estimate of. I mean, basically, we haven't. We have done the. I think the, the proper comparison is to look at basically which cell types show this. And the, the thing is that this is something we can look at for uh, for the mouse uh, based on well your work, Tom. Uh, but uh, we haven't done that for um, for the the axle at at least not systematically. My expectations would be that you see that more often. Uh, just because, yeah, there are more, more on and off cells. But um, yeah, it, it's hard to make the count. The thing is, okay, one limitation here is because we're kind of flashing natural images and we don't know yet which part of the, these, the, the scene these, the cell is looking at. Um, the, the thing is that I think there are a lot of cases where we, we have seen that um, we don't see a change in the on and off uh, local STA. But then basically we think it's just because it was looking at the wrong part of the image. Okay. So basically there can be, if you don't see these, change, these on off changes, it can due to, be due to two reasons. The first one is that really that cell type does not show it, but it can also be due to the fact that uh, basically uh, at that moment, there's always some, let's say to simplify things that there's always something bright inside the receptive field. So always get on like, uh, on like receptive field. I mean, the thing is, Measuring this local state takes time. And in the best cases, I think we could do it for like 12 images. So if you're kind of unlucky, maybe you won't see it because it's always looking at something not dark enough or not bright enough to get the, the or of or, or like uh, STA. So th th there's a component here. We have done an estimation of basically how many, how, what's the ratio of cell we should see uh, based on the modeling and what we see in experiments. And basically there's a difference here, which is exactly due to that. So, so that's definitely a limitation. I guess if you do loose patch, you wouldn't have that limitation. You could just choose exactly what you want to do. Right. Uh, thank you very much, Olivier. One last question that just appeared from Simon Laughlin. Uh, there are many RGC types. If the majority behave as you say, does this indicate that uh, photoreceptors and horizontal cells extract local contrast and code it as transmitter release? No, I, so yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I don't think so. Well. I mean, I haven't looked at, I haven't, I haven't measured the response. And the thing is, of course, here I'm just focusing on the one where we see something interesting, but there are also other cells where basically we don't see this inversion of polarity. And where uh, if we actually plot the, um, the, um, the the same kind of you know vector field and we do the same analysis that I was doing, uh, doing before, we see that kind of thing, which we actually call like luminance encoding cells. You can argue whether this is really encoding luminance or not. But the idea here is that all the arrows more or less point in the same direction to some extent. And uh, so here the idea is that in that case, this is cells where you don't see a change in the on-off selectivity. You can uh, in, in uh, and, and there are some cells where we, we don't see it. Uh, several cell types where uh, we have reported that in the paper actually, um, uh, where we never see a change uh, so if the information has been preserved up to some type of ganglion cell, my guess is that it's also preserved at the at earlier level, at least for some types. Uh, so I guess that at the level of horizontal and uh, horizontal and butterfly receptor, it's probably still there, and that the you know the the, the thing that actually creates these complex uh, contrast encoding cells is 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 downstream. But of course, you know. It's only a speculation and I could be wrong. Right. Thank you very much, Olivier. Um, at this point, like I have a number of questions, like follow up, like with respect to regionalization and transient versus sustained and so on. But let's continue this offline. So at this point, I would like to thank you once again uh, for giving this very interesting talk. Uh, and of course, thank the audience uh, for attending yet another uh, Sussex Vision uh, seminar. Thank you very much. And we are officially offline. So because you say like this luminance encoder, like 